It's rare for the SCP Foundation to encounter an anomaly that volunteers information about itself, that seems to actively desire to be studied, to be investigated, to be known. But SCP-082 is one such anomaly. SCP-082 calls himself Ferdinand, a giant man with an even bigger appetite, and though he is cheerful and chatty, even friendly by SCP Foundation standards, it can be difficult to sort the fact from the fiction where his life story is concerned. At various points in his containment, he has claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, Sherlock Holmes, Alexander the Great, Dr. Frankenstein and his monster, Napoleon, and Big Bird, to name a few. But on October 27, 2016, Ferdinand made a particular unusual request. He asked for a set of poetry books, a stack of blank paper, and a quill. He isolated himself for days, refusing to eat, drink, or sleep as he wrote page after page. When he was finished, he had written a poem that seemed to be the first honest exploration of his life story since he was first contained by the Foundation. It can be difficult to determine when SCP-082 is lying, since he is always grinning widely and claims to only lie when it is through his teeth. But after reading the aforementioned poem aloud, he wept openly in what seemed to be a genuine display of emotion. According to the events described in the poem, which should be taken with a small grain of salt, this is what Ferdinand's life was like before he became SCP-082. Ferdinand could not remember his earliest years, what his parents or his childhood home might have looked like. His earliest memory was of a makeshift home in an alleyway, a box to sleep in, and a bundle of rags serving as a makeshift bed. For food, he would steal day-old bread thrown out by a nearby bakery and catch birds and rats that were slow enough for him to grab. Even as a young boy, he was enormous, three times the size of other boys his age. His strength and stature made him appealing to the workhouses at first, but they always ended up throwing him out, calling him a monster, le monstre. After the third workhouse chased him into the streets with whips, he resigned himself to a solitary life in the shadows, down the abandoned alleyways where not even the beggars would go. So overrun were they with rats and filth. It was better for Ferdinand that way. No one would try to mock him, to hurt him, to dispose of the monster once and for all. He spent his days and nights there, in the little alleyway he had turned into a home, keeping as quiet as possible out of fear that he would be discovered by someone with ill intentions. One night, he got his hands on a row of meat tarts left on a windowsill and ate to his heart's content. He slept unusually soundly that night, with a full belly for the first time in a long time, and without knowing it, he must have begun to snore. As the first soft beams of sunlight fell across his face, stirring him from sleep, he heard the sound of a strange man's voice. Perhaps it was someone just passing by on a nearby street, but no. There was a shadow at the end of the alleyway, blocking out some of the light. He retreated out of sight, hoping to avoid detection, but he could see two more blurry figures stepping into his vision. All of a sudden, they started running towards him at top speed. This was no accidental encounter. They had spotted him and were targeting him specifically. For what? He didn't want to find out. The giant boy climbed to his feet and tried to run, but the alley was narrow, and the three men grabbed hold of each of his arms, while one grabbed his legs and forced him to the ground. Someone stuffed a dirty rag into his mouth, muffling his cries for help, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw the glint of a metal pipe swinging at his head. Then, everything went dark. When Fernand opened his eyes again, all he could see was red, vivid red on all sides. As his vision adjusted, he realized he could see metal bars as well. The red was fabric, bright cloth draped over the iron cage that now held him prisoner. He stumbled to his feet, forced to stoop to avoid bumping his head on the top of the cage, and rattled the bars desperately. Let me out, please! He begged, though he felt as though it was useless. His plea was not met with silence, however, but with loud, cheerful music. He covered his ears at the sudden noise, jumping back, but it came from all sides, and there was no escape. Suddenly, his eyes were blinded by a sudden bright light as the red cloth was yanked from the cage in one swoop. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust, but as he blinked the tears from his eyes, Ferdinand could make out a man with a large mustache, a long red and gold coat, a matching top hat, and a gold-tipped cane. The man grinned at him, 
but it was not a friendly face. The smile did not reach his eyes, which glinted with a cold, cruel delight. Behind the ringmaster, Ferdinand could now see a crowd sitting, men, women, and children all watching him with rapturous fascination, a mix of intrigue, disgust, and horror on their faces. He looked from face to face, seeking any kindness, any sympathy, but found not one who looked as if they might help him escape. The music climbed to a crescendo, and when it stopped, the ringmaster spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, today I have brought you something the likes of which no one has ever seen before. I have traveled the world in search of oddities and curiosities to delight and shock you with. And after crossing every ocean, exploring the furthest reaches of the globe, I have brought you a very special gift. Do not be afraid, the beast will not harm you. I will ensure that you are all perfectly safe. Should he try anything at all, one of my helpers here? He gestured to one of two large men standing on either side of the cage, each brandishing an axe. We'll simply strike him with their axes. Ferdinand recoiled at the threat, but there was nowhere for him to go in the cramped cage, already a bit too small for his massive body. The ringmaster continued his speech, pacing back and forth in front of the cage and running his cane across the bars with a horrible clattering sound. As you can see, this creature looks like a boy, but his statue reveals the truth. It is something else entirely. Something bigger, stronger, more vicious than any child could ever be. You see the legs like great tree trunks, the arms strong enough to wrestle a bear. But do not, dear audience, neglect to notice its <laughs> mighty jaws. Like steel, strong enough to crush anything it bites down on, strong enough to crack through bone, and the teeth, enormous and pearly white, with a smile bright enough to light up the darkness. What do you say, beast? Will you give the people a smile? Fernand cowered in the cage, watching everything with wide, frightened eyes. He certainly did not feel like smiling. When he did not budge, the ringmaster thwacked his cane against the bars, making another horrible metallic clang. Well, these people paid good money to be here. Do not keep them waiting! After another moment of silence and Fernand remained stock still, the audience began to boo, tossing empty popcorn bags and insults at the cage. The ringmaster leaned in close and whispered, Smile for the people, or I'll see to it you suffer agony you could only dream of. This threat snapped Ferdinand out of his frozen terror, and standing as tall as he could in the little cage, he smiled wide, showing all of his many, many teeth at once. The audience erupted into cheers at the sight, and the band played triumphant horns as the ringmaster basked in the applause. How about that? The ringmaster took off his hat and bowed low to the ground, holding out his hat for the audience to toss in coins in a token of their appreciation for an excellent show. By the time the applause was finished, his hat was filled with shiny silver and gold. He tossed the hat, now heavy with new wealth, to one of the guards and pulled a gold-handled whip from his pocket. Aha, but we haven't finished yet! He cracked the whip ominously, then turned toward the cage. He cracked the whip again, this time across Ferdinand's back. The boy roared in pain, a great bellowing sound that carried for miles around, and he fell to his knees. The sound was so loud, so powerful, that the audience was terrified. Small children began to cry, and people poured from the circus tent in a panic, afraid the beast would break free and tear them apart. But there was no beast, only a frightened boy who did not understand his own strength, crying at the cruelty the world had shown him all his life. Once they were alone, the ringmaster turned to Ferdinand again, catching his eye. Stop your crying, boy. From here on out, you'll be coming with me. Together, we're going to be very, very rich. And I will make you a star, whether you want to be one or not. And for a time, that became Ferdinand's life. Night after night, crammed into a cage, fed on chicken bones and leftover scraps, paraded in front of uncaring audiences as the ringmaster tormented him, showing him off as a sideshow attraction, and forcing him to smile with the threat of the axe or the whip. His fellow circus folk were not much kinder than the ringmaster either. The clown sprayed him with water and taunted him through the bars. The animal trainers threatened to pit him against their lions and see who came out alive. Only one person ever showed Ferdinand an ounce of kindness at the circus. A bearded lady who would sing opera songs in a beautiful, clear soprano. 
Her voice was the loveliest thing Ferdinand had ever heard. A tiny slice of heaven in the hell his life had become. Days bled together as the tour went on, a stretch of seemingly endless days and nights, until the day of the last show came. He looked up at the thin slivers of night sky visible through the gaps in the tent, the twinkling of stars just out of reach. What would become of him after the tour ended? What horrors awaited him next? Would he just sit there and take it? Or would he finally do something to bring it all to a close? He flexed his muscles quietly, taking notice of how he had grown over the past few months. Regular feedings, more than he had gotten on the street, had bulked him up considerably. He now stood at over seven feet tall, and could feel that his strength had doubled, or even tripled. The show began as it usually did, with the crack of the ringmaster's whip. But suddenly, the man stepped forward and began a speech he had never made before. As you can see, this great beast cowers at the sound of my whip. Over the months, I have trained it, domesticated it until it was aggressive no longer. Behold, as I set it free! And to Ferdinand's shock, the ringmaster unlocked the door to the cage and swung it open. He took a tentative step out, standing at his full height for the first time in months as he stretched his spine straight. See how it is tamed! Go on now, boy. Smile for your public. They've been so good to us. He jabbed Ferdinand's ribs with his cane, hard enough to leave a dark purple bruise. You heard me smile! The whip cracked again, and the audience began to boo and jeer, throwing their garbage at Ferdinand. A bag hit his cheek with a slap, and a deep, dark rage finally awoke beneath the months of terror. You remember our agreement. Do as I say, or I shall cut off something you'll miss. Before the ringmaster could say another word, Ferdinand grabbed him and pulled him into a bone-crushing embrace. The man's voice came out in a squeak. Please, what are you doing? That is not my name! Ferdinand bellowed, and he opened his mouth wide, wider than he ever had before, and gobbled up the ringmaster in three quick bites. The audience screamed, fleeing from their seats, but Ferdinand moved faster than they did. He grabbed person after person, starting with those that had been the cruelest, and shouted the most insulting things, and devoured them one by one. When he was full, he ran into the night, into the forest, and did not stop until he was free. He bathed in the river, washing away all that he had done, and remained there for quite some time, feeding on passerbys when his hunger got the better of him. His sense of time grew fuzzy then, and he could not be sure how long he spent there. But word of missing townspeople eventually reached a special organization, one dedicated to studying those like him. And for the second time in his life, Ferdinand was taken into custody by strangers. However, these scientists were much kinder to him and never called him a beast. They simply gave him a number, SCP-082. Want to own an SCP of your own? Go to scpswag.com for premium anomalous merchandise. Now go and check out SCP-082 Ferdinand the Cannibal and SCP-001 Can SCP-049 Finally Cure When Day Breaks for more bizarre and disturbing Ferdinand antics.